folkies! Emily Valken here, and in this video we're gonna talk about bowing patterns. What they are from, what's their origin, what they are, why they are so important in skinny folk music, and also how to use them in your own playing. Before getting into this fascinating program, I just want to say, as usual, that I don't know everything, that I may say mistakes, and that I'm only talking from my own experience and point of view, so you might not resonate with what I say, and it's totally fine. What I'm trying to make to do with those videos is to just bring some infos to people who might find them useful because they like Scandi folk music and they would like to know more. That's just it. This being said, let's get into the subject. So, why are bowing patterns existing? What is their origin? Basically, there is one big thing that you should know about Scandi folk music if you don't know already, is that it's highly dominated by one instrument, fiddle. Here I say folk music, I have to precise a little bit because there are some subgenres that are not that much dominated by fiddle actually. There is the singing repertoire, which is of course more about singing. There is for example also the gamel dance uh, repertoire, which is more about or accordion maybe and other instruments. But here I'm going to talk about what is considered, at least in Sweden, as folk music, folk music and it's mostly revolving about around polska and some other types of uh, dances and tunes as well. So this type of folk music is highly dominated by fiddles and has been for centuries. And an example I like to give for that is if you go to a folk festival in Sweden and you take 100 musicians, you will probably find 90% of those musicians, so 90 of them, being fiddlers, having fiddles. In fiddles I also include violas and five strings. And then on the 10 remaining people, you might have five nickel harpas and then other instruments. And this is just to explain to you how much the folk scene nowadays and also in historical times is dominated by bowed instruments. And this is important to keep in mind because bowed instruments have defined how folk music is played and has been played for a long, long time. So they are strongly rooted together, those two things. If you don't play a bowed instrument, I think bowing patterns still have a lot of interest for you, what, whichever instrument you're playing, because you can adapt the, like, the way of putting the energy, which is done on the fiddle by the bow, on your own instrument. I just don't know the techniques to do that, but it's probably very interesting to explore. So stick with me, we're gonna explore this subject that are bowing patterns. What are they, bowing patterns? Basically, a bowing pa pattern is a structure of movements of the bow. So, when is the bow going down? When is the bow going up? Which notes are slurred together and which notes are separated? And this is a structure that is gonna be repeated several times and happen in most of one tune. And it can be a structure that is as short as one beat and it can be as long as one bar. There might be other length, but I don't know. I have only found those two lengths, so one beat or one bar. And actually there are some that are longer, but let's talk about that later. And there are several like genres of bowing patterns, in a way. There are some that are very, very global. For example, in Sweden, you start a tune on the one by going down bow. And you end up a musical phrase by going up bow, so you can start the next one, down bow again. And I'm just gonna add a little parenthesis there. If there is a pickup, you just, of course, take it up bow so you're down on the one. The one down is what is important. This is true for most of the Swedish tunes. Um, keep that in mind, we're gonna talk about that later. <laughs> Again, this is so a general pattern for one country and possibly for other tunes as well. I know in Norway it's also the case, but not always. And there are some other uh, bowing patterns that are just much more specific, like they are related to one type of tune in particular. And when I say one type of tune, it can be short first beat polskas, or it can be one type of short first beat polska from one very specific region. So they can be of different scales about what type of tune they are. And now, question, why are they so important in the playing? As said before, Scandi folk music has been highly dominated by bowed instruments for a long time and still is. And therefore, the music has been shaped by the fact of just that you have a bow. And what does a bow do? 
it gives energy. It is what shapes the music in a way or another. It's the bow which gives more sound, less sound, something softer, something quieter, something crispy, something tender. That's all the bow quality, the bowing, the bowing, the bowing playing, actually. And therefore, it's what gives to the music, the bow is what gives the music its energy. And I hope you know that um, folk music and folk dance are just super tight together. And that's why also the bowings are important because they give the energy to the music and the dancers need this energy to be able to dance the tunes because they need some lifts and some heaviness on some points and so on. I have a tendency to compare a bowing patterns and bowing energy to accents in a language. When you learn a language, of course, you learn the vocabulary and the grammar and so on, but you also learn the pronunciation and the accents that are part of the language. You learn where to put longer tones, higher tones, when to go up with your voice or where to go down. And this is exactly the same with bowing patterns. Now I hope you are convinced that bowing patterns are very important for your music if you play Scandi Folk. And now we're going to talk about how to practice them and use them in your own music. So first thing you would like to do when you want to work about uh, bowing patterns is to choose a tune and to know where it's from and what type of tune it is. And sometimes it's very easy because the tune is called Spring Lake from da da da. So you know it's a Spring Lake. It's very easy. But sometimes it's not as as easy because sometimes it's called Polska, for example, which is not precise. And how to know which type of tune you have? Well, first use your ears. You can hear very clearly if it's a short first beat, usually. So then you have an idea, okay, it's a short first beat Polska, so I know there is a general bowing pattern about those, so I can probably use that for this tune. And also you can check where the tune is from. So for example, uh, if you know that your tune is from here, somewhere in Vestadolona, and you know a bit of the Venla music, and you know a bit of the Röros music, there are chances that it will be kinda in between or belonging to the same family, probably. You're not, you can't be sure, but use logic and use geography and use your ears, and usually you will find something that is kinda correct. Once you know where your tune is from, and at least what type of tune it is, you can start digging about, uh, you can start wondering about <laughs> what bowing pattern you should use on that tune. And sometimes you just happen to have the information, you have heard it, for example, in the videos here or somewhere. Good, fine, then you can go to the next step. If you don't know the bowing pattern, you can ask people. Uh, usually in courses with Scandi teachers, they will tell you about bowing patterns or if they don't tell you themselves, you can just ask them and they will give you the answer of bowing pattern used for that type of tune. Um, but if you can't get any info directly from someone or somewhere, what you can do is try to figure out yourself the bowing pattern. This is a bit tricky, but it's possible. And if you have no information, it's better to have a global idea than to have nothing, in my opinion. How to figure out a bowing pattern? Well, or see someone live, or get a video of their playing, and check what they're doing with their right hand. When is the bow going down? When is it going up? Which notes are slurred and which are not? And if you analyze that very closely, you can probably notice that there is a pattern repeating itself. It might vary a little bit from time to time, but there is a general thing in there. And this is very probably your bowing pattern, or at least close to it. Once you have your bowing pattern, it's time to practice it. So what I suggest you do is you take the tune and you play it slowly, calmly, with the bowing pattern everywhere you can. For example, I have talked that this bowing pattern, tia ta ta, I call it like this, is very typical and traditional for 16th notes polska. So if you're playing a 16th note polska, you just take every beat you have four 16th notes and you play tia ta ta, tia ta ta, very, very, like, consistently. And here sheet music for once in folk music is actually very useful. I think it's a bit easier if you can use sheet music because you can write down the bowings very clearly and you can follow them. 
like you can really be consistent writing them and following them. It's a bit trickier if you just do by ear, but it's also working. You can also do it by ear. So fine, no worries if you don't use sheet music. So just practice this and my tip to you would be to play several tunes of the same type at the same time, to work on them at the same time with the same bowing pattern. So your bowing pattern will learn to be there with different melodies because a melody, especially string crossings, can change a lot the feeling of the bowing pattern. And so far so you just practice this again and again and you just get used to it and feel it getting more and more natural. And when it's getting natural, now it's time to adapt a bit the bowing patterns to the melody. The problem you might meet very soon in this stage of your uh, learning is that you will end up with having your bow not following the big rule I told you that in Sweden we go down on the first like note of the uh, first beat of the melody and up in the end. And this might not work with a tune. Maybe just if you follow the bowing pattern all the way through, you end up with a long down bow. So to start again, you would be up bow and you don't want that. And what I would tell you to not do first is to not lift your bow. You don't play your long note and then <gasps> and you start again. In Sweden, we don't lift the bow most of the time. It can happen, but it's very, very seldom. So don't lift your bow. There are other solutions. What you can do is the first one, first solution is very easy is just to split your long half note, for example, into two quarter notes. Instead of playing da, and then you're stuck in the wrong direction for the next phrase, you can play da, da, and then you're welcome. You're at the frog and you can go down bow on the next phrase again. This is the easiest fix. There are other possibilities. For example, you have many, many beats that are composed of uh, 16th notes and you have done your pattern ti ya ta ti ya ta ti ya ta ta everywhere. But actually you decide that to solve your problem of the last note being on the wrong direction, you will play instead of tia ta on the last pattern, you're gonna play tia tia, which is another pattern that is totally accurate for traditional music. So you will play that and once again, your problem is solved, you are in the right direction with your book. And um, so at that point, you also probably have noticed that in some point in the melody, the bowing pattern, like the, the main bowing pattern, might not work very well. For example, there are string crossings that are very tricky with the bowing pattern, or it just doesn't sound good, or any other technical problem, like where the melody and the bowing pattern are a bit like competing with each other. And here you can start adapting the bowing pattern to your melody. So you will change a little bit, you will slur more things, you can do another tia tata, for example, or tia tia instead of tia tata, or you can slur maybe three notes together, you adapt a little bit. You try to stick to the pattern, but you start modifying a little bit so it fits the melody itself. And now you have probably understood where we are going. <laughs> Basically, bowing patterns are a basis on which you can then build your own stuff. And that's especially the case when you start studying what great players are doing with their bow. Because some are following bowing patterns very closely and some are not. That's their artistic choices that are speaking and they try sometimes other bowings that are crazy or interesting or that they find better, just sounding better. And as an artist you perfectly have the right to do so as well. And here I'm gonna talk about uh, Patrick Andersson, my previous te teacher, who is a super good slang polska player, but I was super confused when I met him uh, and heard him play the first time because he plays traditional slang polska, but he doesn't play tia tata and tia tia all the time, maybe only half of the time. And the rest of the time he does his own bowings, in a way. But he knows the bowing patterns and he does those bowings on purpose. And he does it so well because he knows the music and he knows where to put accents and heaviness and light stuff and so on that it just sounds good and it's very danceable and it's perfectly in time and you don't feel it's not traditional but it's still Patrick personal. Personal? Yeah, it's like reflecting his personality. And here comes the big question about tradition that is also a big debate in other like worlds, not only in folk music. And I have this, this question as well in me. I have a part of me which just wants to be 
myself, I want to do things my own way and be creative and inventing and do things as I want them to be. And there is the other part of me where I want to do things following the tradition because I respect this tradition very, very much because I think it's beautiful and it brought me so much beautiful music. And sometimes those two things are not easy to put together. And this is actually a personal, there is no perfect answer, it's a personal answer that you can bring to this question. Some people are more traditional and some people are more experimental. But my opinion on that, my solution to this question, and I'm just giving it to you for now, is that I am working on my basis first and then I grow free. So I see myself a bit as a big tree and I'm trying to grow very strong and deep roots in the soil of tradition. So first I'm making sure that I'm solid about that. And once I'm solid, I know I am totally free to grow branches and leaves in the direction I want, even if it's a crazy one. So my suggestion about bowing patterns is that first you study them closely so you really know them well and then you get free from them if you want. Also because this will give you more things in your toolbox so you will basically have more tools to use when you are playing music to shape it the way you want. That's just my point of view. <laughs> um, a last tip I would like to give you about bowing patterns in general is when you learn a new tune, especially if you learn it live from a teacher, try to not use 100% of your brain on the melody and notes. Fiddle and Nicarapa players, we are melody players, we have a tendency to stick a lot to the melody and be very focused on that, which is okay, but I would suggest that you keep 20-30% of your brain space for bowing. Um, why that? Because then you will learn the bowings at the same time as the tune and it will stick in your brain much better and it will be more associated with the tune. There are several techniques to learn that. I'm just gonna share with you one that was given to me by Shelley Erik Eriksson from Jemtland. So when he has a field course, he's teaching tunes and when the students kinda have the tunes, not perfectly but roughly they have the notes, he asks them to play the melody with the left hand but the right hand will go in the elbow, so under the instrument. So they won't hear if the melody is not completely correct and they will be able to hear him play because he plays on the strings and they can follow his bowing closely, very closely. And I think this is a very good thing to do. So you can do that, you can also just have your bow in the air and bow in the air, you can find your own way to adapt this. But try to learn the bowings at the same time as the tune. Also because every teacher, every player has a different way of bowing and the more you learn about that, the more tools you will have in your toolbox once again. So this was about bowing patterns. I hope it helped you. I hope it gave you a lot of motivation to explore this subject if you didn't know it already or even if you did. As usual, if you have any question about bowing patterns or any Scandi folk thing, just feel free to write to me. Also, if you have critics or suggestions for future videos, I'm very happy to get your nerdy comments and messages. And I am apologizing because this video is coming out in March and it was supposed to be February. I just had a break from music because I was working a lot and I had no brain space for that at the moment. It's gonna start being uh, two videos per month. One more like talking, like this one, and one just to teach you a tune. So it's going to be a short one, just where I teach you a good tune. So that's for the future. I hope you enjoyed this video. As usual, big thank you for your support since I started making these videos. And I hope you have a lot of fun with bowing patterns. See you next month!